Hello, my name is Volodymyr Kruj, and I give short lectures for agronomists simply about microbes. Last time, we talked about strains and metabolites, and this time, we'll introduce you to soil ecology. Soil is the most favorable environment for microorganisms. In one gram of healthy soil, there are hundreds of species with a population of more than a few billion. Let's figure out where all the microbiological processes take place. The first zone is phylloplane. The above ground part of plants, their leaves and shoots covered with microorganisms. The second zone is rhizoplane, the surface of plant roots and soil, which is also inhabited with microorganisms. The third zone is rhizosphere, a narrow strip of soil along the roots, the most richly populated with microorganisms. Also, a large number of soil microorganisms are free-living and use mineral and organic compounds, water and oxygen for sustenance. If we divide all organisms by nutrition type, we can distinguish three large groups – producers, consumers and decomposers, or saprophytes. The first group is producers. They are able to synthesize organic matter from inorganic using solar energy or chemical reaction energy and minerals dissolved in the soil. The second group is consumers. They need ready-made organic matter for nutrition. Large herbivores feed on plants, predators feed on herbivores, and their waste products and body remains return to soil, becoming food for the next group of organisms, decomposers. Decomposers, or saprophytes, are a broad group of microscopic fungi and bacteria that use dead organic matter for their nutrition. They decompose it into simple organic and mineral compounds, which later become food for plants. This is how the cycle of organic matter occurs in nature. And soil stores some of this matter in the form of humus. Biodestructors, microbial products for plant residue decomposition, also belong to decomposers because their composition includes saprophytes. It is important to understand what type of interrelations is characteristic of organisms. Let's start with symbiosis. For some reason, it is considered that it is an exclusively positive phenomenon. But it's not that straightforward. There are several types of symbiosis. The first type is mutualism, and it is indeed positive. In this type of relationship, both organisms that affect each other benefit. For example, a plant and mycorrhiza, or a plant and nodule bacteria. The second type is commensalism. In this type of relationship, one organism benefits and the other does not even notice the influence. For example, commensals are orchids that attach to trees and grow in them, but do not affect them in any way. The third type of symbiosis is amensalism. In this case, one organism inhibits another, but does not even benefit from it. For example, a forest, when the tree crowns do not allow the sunlight to pass down and thus inhibits the growth of herbaceous plants. Another type of symbiosis is parasitism. In this case, one host organism fully provides its parasite with nutrients. It should be noted that a parasite is not interested in the death of its host and therefore it can be sucking juices out of it for a long time. Examples of parasites include sunflower broom rape or the parasitic fungus Coniotherium minutans, which parasitizes sclerotia. In addition to symbiosis, there are two other types of relationships, predation and antibiosis. In predation, one organism feeds on the organs or tissues of another, but does not necessarily kill its prey. With antibiosis, both organisms negatively affect each other, and one of them necessarily dies in the end. So let's take a look at all this in action and try to understand the ecology. Let's start with the fundamental process, namely photosynthesis, since it is photosynthesis that makes possible the very existence of life on Earth. Plants and some microorganisms use solar energy and mineral compounds from soil to synthesize organic substances, such as proteins, fats and sugars. From these substances, they build their own organs, use these substances to saturate their fruits, and plants secrete these substances from their roots into the soil, 
thus feeding the soil microbiota. Then herbivores feed on plants and predators feed on herbivores. When the time comes, their remains and waste products return to soil and become food for the saprophytic microbiota. These microorganisms decompose their remains and feed the plants. Thus, the cycle comes full circle and starts all over again. While the freebie solar energy accumulates in soil and gets stored in the form of humus, the problem arises when man intervenes in the balanced natural cycle. We harvest bumper crops while actually removing organic matter from soil. We burn crop residues, destroying beneficial microorganisms that have developed in the rhizosphere over the whole year. We apply mineral fertilizers and chemical pesticides, destroying beneficial microorganisms and, in fact, breeding aggressive pathogens. All this leads to gradual depletion of humus reserves, changes in agrochemical properties of soil and its erosion. What should we do about it? The answer is simple. Switch to smart use of chemicals and not exceed the recommended application rates of pesticides and mineral fertilizers. And reduced rates of NPK should be compensated with microbial and fungal preparations. We should return organic substances and crop residues to soil. Use microbial destructors that will help restore the balance in soil. That's all for today. In the next video, we will introduce you to the concept of mycorrhiza and why it is necessary for plants. Please ask your questions in the comments, like our page and subscribe to the channel. Till next time, goodbye.